Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 17. The Lord willing, we'll wrap it up this morning. I'll try not to get on too many rabbit trails. I'll try. That wasn't a guarantee. So here we are looking at Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, Paul the Apostle, Silas, Timothy, they've been traveling together since they left Philippi. Uh, and from there, they had traveled to Thessalonica, the capital city of Macedonia. Uh, and things had gone swimmingly for about three weeks. <laughs> and then uh, trouble began to break out. The unbelieving Jews stirred up a crowd, if you remember, in the city. Uh, and they went down to the marketplace and recruited some thugs and attacked the home where evidently Paul and his companions had been staying. Uh, so they ended up being ushered out of Thessalonica under the cover of night. Uh, and from there, they traveled to a town called Berea, which is a smaller city a short distance to the west from where they had been. And so we looked at last week how the people of Berea, they, remember, they had that notable characteristic. You've if you've been a Christian for any length of time at all, you, you've heard the term, be like the Bereans. And that's because the characteristic that they had uh, was that they, after Paul would lay out, remember, Paul would lay down the, the, the gospel, and then he would go to the Old Testament scriptures. It wasn't old to them, but he would go to the, the, the word of God, and he would say, look, this is the fulfillment. Jesus is the fulfillment. He is the Messiah. And the Bereans would take that information and then go check it out for themselves. So uh, they wanted to see if the things that Paul was saying were so. Uh, a great quality. Don't, don't just take my word for it or anybody else's. So we looked last week also at Paul's desire to go back to Thessalonica, to return to the Thessalonians. He wasn't there for very long. And once he got to Berea, it wasn't that far of a, a trip back. However, we read in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 where Satan hindered him and he tried several times to get back. So there they are in Berea and the unbelieving Jews from Thessalonica then, the way that Satan hindered them was that they sent guys from Thessalonica down to Berea to harass the men some more. And so there they come under persecution again. So as a result, Paul was forced to, it says he, that he retreated to the sea. And, and we're not sure if he traveled along the coast over land, but probably over by boat because it was like almost 300 miles to Athens. Uh, and then when he got there, he gave the men that helped him, he gave them instructions. He said, look, send Silas and Timothy straight away. Have them come and join me. And they wouldn't join him. So we'll look at that next week when we get into chapter 18 and Paul goes to Corinth. But uh, we left off last week with verse 16, and for context, I want to start with the same verse today. Uh, in verse 16, it says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Now, the Greek word for provoked is perizuna, uh, and it means to become angry or exasperated, or it could also mean to stimulate to action. And it was probably a bit of both. Have you ever been in a place where your spirit is provoked to thing you, okay, look, I've had it. <laughs> I'm going to check this thing out. I'm going to wade in here. And he wades in. It's not like he's all ticked off, but he is serious because he's grieved at what he sees. The rampant idolatry in Athens, it convicted him. It moved him uh, to... He wanted to share the story of the one God who could save. So to understand too, Paul's a Roman citizen. He gets idolatry. He grew up in Tarsus of Cilicia in a Roman colony. And even though he was Jewish, he saw the Roman and the Greek pantheons of gods that the people, they, got, they just got sideways worshiping these false deities. And so he knew it. It just happens to be that when he gets to Athens, there's such a high concentration. As I talked about last week, 3,000 altars to these foreign, these, these deities and, and, and more idols, the, the, the trinkets, the people, the, the 
stone or, or metal idols that they would make, they were more numerous than the people themselves. So this place was given over. Paul also knew that as a Jew, he, he also understood that Israel had a long history of falling into idolatry themselves. I mean, go all the way back. Uh, accounts in Genesis where uh, Rebecca, he, she steals her father Laban's little idols, his little gods, uh, all the way back. You go all the way back to when the people were delivered from Egypt and they were out there in the wilderness. Moses goes up on the mountain and uh, he comes down and he thinks, what is that? Uh, are the people being attacked? Oh no, it's a party. They're celebrating this golden cow that they had carved out of their gold earrings and all of that. And they actually named that cow Yahweh. <laughs> a bit offensive to God. So he knew, and he knew the consequences. Israel would get carted off into captivity for 70 years because of their idolatry. So he's grieved, he is moved, he is, his spirit is provoked and not a little bit within him as he gets to this town that is just given over and he sees what all of these people are spending, devoting their lives to. Uh, I, I grew up in a false religion and I see people devoting their lives to it and it grieves me, it provokes my spirit, it, it causes me to, to want, I get a burden to want to be able to say, look, there's, there's a true way and yours isn't it. In spite of its reputation as a center for culture and learning, philosophy, and so on, Athens was brimming with spiritual deception. That's the point. And, and, and even now, in Paul's day, 500 years after her prime, because back in the day, back when the Greek empire under Alexander the Great and all of that was going, Athens had been a very powerful city. And now she had been reduced in population and size, but also in influence. Essentially what he's seeing is that Athens is immersed in a strong, demonic presence. He knew it, he sensed it, and therefore his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the things which the people were devoting their lives to. Uh, I don't know about you folks, but there are times where... Uh, I, my heart, again, my heart just gets burdened because I see the things that men chase after. I see the things that people put on that altar. It might not be a physical altar, but that's still there. And that happens with Christians as well. I was talking with Brian a little before the, the service and talking about the things that, and the things that pastors get subjected to. I mean, if I wanted to take this church down the road of entertainment, we could fill the place. If I want to take this church down the road of social justice, we could fill the place. If I want to, and you just go on and on and on. Anything that, that takes the place of Jesus Christ and him crucified is an idol. And we've got to guard our hearts against that ourselves. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul exhorts the church at Corinth which is the next stop, as I mentioned. He says, flee from idolatry. He tells him in 1 Corinthians 10, 20, he says, the things with the gent which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. So you want to know what's behind the idols? Want to know what's behind the idolatry? He says right here, he says, I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. That's pretty serious stuff. Verse 17, therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. That therefore is because his spirit is provoked within him. He is burdened. He, he is greatly affected by this and he wants to be sure to present the truth of Jesus Christ to these people. This is also, we've talked about this before in the book of Acts, we see a familiar pattern Paul would go to the Jews and to the Gentile worshipers, the, the, the ones who had not yet converted to Judaism, but they were there. They were, they were called God-fearers in that day. 
And so he would go to the, the synagogue because they would hang out there as well as the Jews. And he would present the gospel because he's got a launching point. He's got a point of contact. He's got the scriptures. But it says also that he goes to the marketplace every day to those who, and he begins to share the gospel with those that happen to be there. Uh, it's interesting. When he goes to the marketplace, uh, he wants to reason with the people that are caught up in all the pagan, idolatrous religions of Greece and Rome. Uh, I was looking at this, and, and in the original, the word marketplace is the Greek word agora. And that would be the crowded public space square. And, and there are numerous, if it's a large city, there are a lot of public squares. When I was in Rome, we would go to the piazza. And if you went to a different part of Rome, which is a huge city, you could go to another, the plaza is what it was called there. Here it's called the agora. And I was thinking about that, that we have a word called agoraphobia. And that's the fear of crowded places. And people, it's like, oh, no, no, I don't want to go there. And, and so that's where that word comes from. It comes from the marketplace, the central square, the, the place where the crowds were. Verse 18, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So the Epicureans and the Stoics, they're an interesting bunch. And let's get to know them a little bit. I want to read a couple of things here that I came across just to kind of describe. They have, these guys have divergent, totally different worldviews. And they would go up to the Areopagus together and hang out. <laughs> and it was a, a, just a fascinating bunch. So the Epicurean worldview taught that humans have no eternal existence. Uh, that they live in a soulless, mechanical universe. Interesting. And they said, if gods existed at all, that they'd have no interest or involvement uh, with us. And when a person finally recognizes that fact, they're set free from all the superstitions and religious activities that weigh people down. That was their view. They said that the main goal in life is happiness, but... There's a difference between uh, an Epicurean and a hedonist because Epicureans said that that happiness would not be found by, by pursuing sensual pleasure, all right, carnal pleasures. Uh, they said that to become a... Ha that's why uh, if somebody is an Epicurean chef or cook, they're, they're cooking the best stuff, you know, that we use that sometimes, that term. They said that, that to become a happy person you got to learn to avoid pain. And to avoid pain, a person must escape into the inner world of the intellect. Isn't that interesting? We're talking deep philosophical stuff here. So although Epicurean philosophy taught followers not to pursue sensual pleasures, you got to remember, man is still fallen. Man still gravitates towards sin. <laughs> the effect of that functionally atheistic philosophy was to break down religious restraint in people and release them to engage in severe moral corruption. Uh, look around. Look at what happens when you unhook God from the equation. Uh, I, I think about, I look out at our culture, at our society, and I think, you know, It's in the, the last verse in the book of Judges. It says that there was no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And that's the world we live in, folks. Like it or not. Now the Stoics, the Stoic philosophers, they had a pantheistic worldview. In other words, God is everywhere. You know, God is like in this rock. God is in this Kleenex box. God is, you know, and it, is, it, it gets to being ridiculous. But uh, they taught that God was the world's soul. Stoicism taught people to passively submit to the laws of nature. They taught that a truly wise person realizes that whatever life brings, whether it's pleasure or pain or joy or grief, those circumstances come to us because they're part of a divine plan. However, 
When, Sto so when the Stoics spoke about a divine plan, they weren't speaking about the will of a personal God, like the God of the Bible. Rather, they, they were talking about impersonal forces that basically functioned arbitrarily. So th there's no personal aspect of God in their thinking. They pictured those forces like a divine fire that inhabits all of life. And since that impersonal force controls every person's life, a wise person will patiently endure whatever happens to them, whether good or bad. Happiness could only be found by peacefully embracing one's destiny. So you hear about somebody being stoic, it's like I'm unfazed. Doesn't matter if it's something to make me happy, something to make me sad, if it's something tragic, if it's something really good, whatever it is, I have disciplined myself to not be phased by that because after all, I'm kind of above that. It produces a pretty weird kind of a whack spiritual pride in people that are in that place. However, when you talk about the, the force, <laughs> I'm not going to get into Star Wars. I don't want to go there. But it talks about this impersonal force. And, and I think about in New Age philosophy, if you talk to somebody that is into New Age philosophy, they'll talk about like, unlike the energy, you know, like the, um, you know, the, the, and that everything is reduced to this impersonal force. And that, well, there's just like, you know, and I have, I have a niece that I pray for that, I mean, she wanted to go to Mount Shasta because like, there's like this place for harmonic conversion and, you know, just stuff or convergence. Yeah. Anyway, it, but that's the way of man. And, and, and I'll tell you what, folks, if you don't stand for something, you're prone to fall for anything. And that's just how we are. So that's the Stoics and the philosopher and the Epicureans, the philosophers that Paul's dealing with there in Athens. They called him a babbler. And that's an interesting word. It literally means seed picker. Uh, the word picture is that of sparrows or birds hopping around in a field eating seeds. Well, what does that mean? Well, it was a metaphor because an itinerant teacher could go along and pick up pieces of information here and there. All right? So the, the, being called a seed picker was an insult because it was similar to calling Paul an ignorant plagiarist. So what does this seed picker have? To, what's he going to share with us? And folks, I have known biblical seed pickers as well, to be fair. People that they get, they get into all kinds of crazy things. And it's like they're picking a piece of information here, a piece of information there, a piece of information here, a piece of, and their life might be a mess, but they're picking up all this information. And it, it's fascinating to me. It, it's, it's sort of being a seed picker. So, The point in all of that is teaching about Jesus was completely foreign to them and because the Greeks deified everything. They deified men's moods. And I think about there at, in Matthew 16 when Jesus and his men are there at Caesarea Philippi and, and they're, they're look, standing in front of what was called the Temple of Pan. You ever heard of the Pan flute? That's where that comes from because Pan was like this guy half human, half goat. And, and he was the god of pain. And, and if you were worked up about something, that was because of Pan's influence and the whole story there. But I mean, the Greeks, they had gods for everything. And, and a lot of inanimate objects as well. Like I said, people's moods influenced by their gods. The Athenians, they looked at Paul's teaching about Jesus as just another foreign god. And so in verse 19, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is which you speak? Uh, verse 20, for you're bringing some strange things to our ears, and therefore we want to know what these things mean. So they take him to the Areopagus. <laughs> The Areopagus, now literally what that means, it means the hill of Ares. And Ares was the Greek god of war. 
You may also have been heard, you may also have heard that, that here in Acts 17, that this is called Paul's sermon at Mars Hill. Okay. Mars is the Roman equivalent of Ares. Mars is the Roman god of war because there, there are two pantheons here. There's the pantheon of the Greeks and the pantheon of the Romans, and they borrowed from each other a lot. <laughs> but that's why this place has two names. It's called the Areopagus, the Hill of Ares, or Mars Hill, uh, both of them being the respective gods of war in those cultures. Now, in the golden days of Athens, it was a philosophical forum uh, that dominated the whole city. I mean, this is where the intellectuals went. This is where they went and decided things. The Areopagus was also uh, the meeting place of the Council of the Areopagus, which was the supreme body of judicial and legislative matters in Athens. This is where all the court cases were decided back in the day. However, by the first century, its power had been reduced to oversight over religion, matters of religion, and matters of education. And that was the extent of the power and the authority that the council, uh, the Areopagus, had. So Paul gets brought up before this council. They were also the guys that licensed preachers to preach in Athens. And so they want to know, what is, what is this thing you're talking about, Paul? We haven't heard this before. And so we're very curious. We want you to tell us about it. Verse 21, for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear some new thing. I, I put in my notes, some new idolatrous thing. And so these guys, they spent their days doing this. And they just want to talk about every new thing that comes along. And my question becomes then, who are the seed pickers? <laughs> Certainly not Paul. These guys, they just want to talk about one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And they're literally fulfilling that thing which they accuse Paul of when he shows up. I also believe this is part of why Paul's spirit was provoked within him. I was thinking about this. I call this the coffee shop mentality. <laughs> Those of you that know me know that I sometimes talk about the coffee shop. Now, there's nothing wrong with sitting in a coffee shop talking about world affairs, okay? There's, I'm, not, I'm not picking on you if that's what you like to do. However, I was reminded as I was preparing for this morning, I was reminded of, I lived in a little farm town in Northern California for many years called, it was named Calusa, California. At the drugstore, they had a t-shirt and it was in the middle of the rice fields. And there was a t-shirt at the drugstore and it said unofficial Calusa County bird and it had a mosquito carrying off a house. <laughs> so just so you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the greatest place to live huge swarms of mosquitoes coming in off of these rice paddies all which surrounded the city. There was a restaurant there called Zim's. And I used to go and have breakfast at Zim's from time to time. It was just a block away from my offices and shop and all that. And um, there at Zim's, they had, there must have been 30 or 40 or more brown coffee cups hanging on the wall. And when I first started going there, I thought, they have that many regular? What does that, all of that mean? And they all had names on them and all of that. Well, it turned out that, especially in the off season, all of the farmers from the entire region would go to Zim's every morning. And what they did was they went and they solved all the world's problems. You've heard that, <laughs> that term before. And so I think about, they would talk about every new thing. And, and as I was thinking of it, looking at this, I think it, they were discussing relevant topics for sure. And they're speaking or hearing them day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out. And at the end of it, it had little effect on one's personal life or upon society in general. Not a bad thing, like I said. Well, I'll get to, I want to have some more to say about that, but I'm going to save it for the end here. <laughs> so, the Areopagus, they're, they're kind of like the guys at the coffee shop. They just want to talk about everything. 
this is verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Now, I looked up <laughs> the word for religion, and it's not the same as is used in the book of James. The word here is dc daemon. That's the, the, the Greek word. And what it means is fearful of deities. <laughs> it means very fearful of gods or superstitious. He says, I see that you folks are fearful of deities, that you folks are paying a lot of attention to all of these pagan deities. It's the same root word as the word that is used for demons. So Paul suddenly implies here that their deities are not... <laughs> They're not gods. They're evil spirits. They're demons. And he understood that religion, when he says this, he says, I, you know, I perceive that you're very religious. But he also understood that that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Because it depends on whether or not that religion is true. And so he knows that these guys, are, they're barking down the wrong trail. They're going, they, they have this complex set of deities that they're worshiping and he knows the one true God and he's finding a point of entry with them so that he can begin to talk about that. He says, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. Verse 23, for as I was passing through, I considered the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. Ah, now we're getting on their level. Now, remember the Athenians, I mentioned this last week, they had about 3,000 altars, I think I mentioned earlier too, in temples in their city. They, I mean, this place was saturated. But somebody somewhere along the line must have thought, well, in case we missed one, Let's, I know, let's build an altar to the unknown God because we want to make sure that we've got all the bases covered. So they dedicated this altar to the unknown God. Now, remember, when speaking to a Jewish audience, Paul would begin with the Old Testament scriptures as a point of entry when he presented the gospel. Well, here, standing before the Athenians, here, the Areopagus, Morris Hill, he understands they don't know the scripture. So, but they do understand philosophy. They do understand religiousness or religiosity. And so he finds a point of entry that they would understand. And, and I think that this is brilliant. We'll talk next week about some, some areas that I think greatly disturbed Paul later as he left Athens and went to Corinth. But you've heard me talk about, uh, when I teach, some, I, like, I call it zoom in, zoom out. Have you ever used a telephoto? Yeah, you don't use those. You use your phone. But <laughs> we used to use the telephoto lens and, and, and zoom way in on something or, or zoom way out, get a wide angle or whatever. Well, what Paul does here is he zooms way out. Okay, He's not specifically talking about the nuts and bolts of the gospel, he's, he zooms way out and he begins with the creation. He says in verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Now, Grecian temples, by the way, they were often seen as a place where gods were fed and cared for. That was part of their whole thing. So as Paul begins, he illustrates the God that he speaks of is far above, infinitely beyond all of the so-called gods that they believe in, and, and that this God, this unknown God that he's proclaiming to them, he has need of nothing from man. as a supreme creator of the heavens and the earth, his existence isn't limited to buildings that are erected by man, nor would he be worshipped by 
idols that were fashioned in men's hands. That's what he's talking about here. He is going right to the heart of idolatry. He's going right to the heart of where they were putting all of their emphasis. He's saying, no, 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 no. That's not going to get you there. So you might be wondering too, because he's talking about God doesn't dwell in temples and he's not, you know, not subject to those things. But you might be wondering, well, didn't the Jews have a temple where they worshiped? Yeah, the answer is yes, they did. But I, you got to remember too, uh, in John chapter four, Jesus has some interaction with a woman from Samaria. And uh, she asks him a question about worship. She says, you know, our fathers worship in this mountain. She's speaking of Mount Gerizim. She's right there at Shechem. Uh, don't need to go into a geography lesson, but she's there and saying, look, we worshiped on Mount Gerizim. They had a temple there until about 140 years before Christ and a, a Jewish general got kind of up in arms and destroyed it. But the point is, he said, they, she said, our, our fathers worshiped in this temple, but you Jews worship in Jerusalem. What do you have to say? And I'm paraphrasing. Well, what do you say, Jesus? Where is it? John 4, 21, and, and then in verse 23, I'll read that. It says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Temples made with hands. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the father seeking such to worship him no longer would worship of god be held in a building yeah now we worship here but i call this a tent for the temple all right this place doesn't glow at night i've been here i i promise you it doesn't it's a wonderful building and i love that god has provided it for us but you are the temple it's not a temple made with hands. And he's saying, look, God doesn't dwell in these temples made with hands, guys. He's telling the Athenians, you, you're going down the wrong road. Again, you have limited God. You, you sort of put God in your back pocket. And God won't be bound to those things. Verse 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell in all the faces of the earth. And he's determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. I love that. Talk about a philosophical treatise, a philosophical talk that Paul is giving these Athenians about who God is. He's saying he's way bigger than, than these stone and, and gold and silver idols that you pack around or these altars and these temples that you build. He's not limited to that. He's also in control of everything. Uh, he, he's determined the pre-appointed times, the boundaries of our dwell, their dwellings, and talking about humanity, his creation. It, and it, I think it's interesting because he clearly asserts the oneness of humanity. Try to find racism in that statement. I'm not going to go there. But... <laughs> He's essentially saying, look, it's a level playing field. Humanity came from one blood. And he asserts that humans are made in the image of God. He also asserts that God's not only created all things, but he directs all things. And he's clearly challenging now the Epicurean philosophy that God, if he exists at all, is not involved in the affairs of his creation. And this would be having, these guys would be scratching their heads about this point because he is totally dismantling their belief systems. Verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. So because they were created in God's image and are obligated to him, the logical conclusion would be to seek him. <laughs> That's his point. He understands also that the spiritual blindness of these pagans that he's addressing is such that he knows that these things would be a stretch for them. Have you ever talked to somebody that you know, they're listening to you, but you know that 
It's a stretch. They're challenged. And he knows that. He also knows that in order to seek the Lord, they'd have to come away from their own idolatrous understanding that they would essentially be groping for him. And you know what? That's okay. I remember groping for God in, in the very early days when the lights were coming on, I felt like, man, I just, I've got to know you. I don't know that much about you. I don't understand, but I know that there's this pull in my soul. I've got to understand who you are. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about groping for God. He was just, they're reaching. He said, you're going to have to reach. You got to get rid of that which you have held on to and come to an understanding of God as he is. When I went to Bible college, I, had a, 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 I, I took copious notes uh, every semester. And, and when, uh, having grown up in, in a, a Mormon church, I would put a great big M on the margin of my notes every time the Spirit of God delivered me from a doctrine that I had grown up understanding. And I got a lot of M's in my notes because I, I had to come to a place of understanding that not all roads lead to God. Not everything that Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. Again, I love that statement. And it's all about him. There's nothing that goes on that he doesn't have influence or control over in our lives. He says, as also some of your own poets have said, for also we are also his offspring. So now Paul begins to quote Greek poets. Uh, and these are people that the Athenians had been familiar with for centuries. I mean, we're going back 600 BC on some of the quotes he's making. Uh, we just don't have time for me to go into it. I, I studied them and got kind of caught up. It's fascinated with these guys and their writings. He's careful not to cite that they were somehow being prophets, but he uses their writings, again, to build a bridge as a point of entry with them so that he can illustrate biblical truths. And that's what he's doing. Verse 29, therefore, since we're the offspring of God, we ought not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. So now, He's been contrasting the God of the universe with their puny idols, <laughs> the ones that were made from gold or silver or stone. And it gets back to Paul's spirit being provoked within him. Uh, he's saying, you're created in God's image. How is it that you reduce God now to graven images? It doesn't make sense. It's completely illogical. He says, truly, in verse 30, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. He says, gentlemen, council of the Areopagus, respectfully, I say, you've got to change your mind about some things. That's what repent means. That God commands all men everywhere to repent, to change their mind about the way that they've been looking. He says, you know what? You've been going down this road all your life. And what is required in this sense, in this moment, is it, <laughs> if you use a modern euphemism, you need to slam the brakes on, put that thing into a four-wheel slide, and come screaming back the other direction. That's repent. Okay? And, and full-blown repentance is something that is noticeable, it is something that's observable, and it is a radical shift from the direction of one's life that one previously was going. And I would throw out, if you are drawing close to God, but you have not repented, you have not totally embraced the things of Christ, do it. Repentance is part of coming to true and genuine faith. Part and parcel. See, these times of ignorance, God has overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. Repent. He's essentially saying, you're responsible for what you know, and I have just laid some stuff on you, and now you're responsible. You need to change your mind about God, because the way you've been doing it hasn't been working. He says, because he's appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to, of this to all by raising him from the dead. That got him. 
So we see a progression here as Paul's been laying these things out. He says, he starts off with talking about God and knowing God as creator. He also talks, and then he goes from knowing who mankind is as his offspring. He progresses and he goes to talking about the understanding, the need to understand man's responsibility before God in worshiping him as he is. Not as man wants him to be, not as you have invented him to be, not through gold and silver and stone idols, but the living God. Now he speaks of man's accountability before God in dishonoring him by rejecting Christ. He says what's left there is judgment. And folks, that's true. God went to great lengths. He sent his son to go to that cross. And to reject that is to reject him. And all that remains for that person is judgment. Verse 32, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Ha <laughs> ha, sure, Paul, whatever. Others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. Well, then we'll get back to you. I do believe, and you know, I, I think that the Lord was showing me some things I haven't seen before in this passage. And one of the things that I, I think is true is Paul was just getting revved up. He was just getting started. He was just getting ready to go down the road and to give them the whole Marianne, and they stopped him. <laughs> when he said their judge would be a man who had already lived and died and been miraculously raised back to life, they stopped him cold, and they dismissed him. Okay, we're good. Thank you, Paul. Now we got it. All right, see ya. <laughs> the Stoics and the Epicureans both, they dismissed the idea of a personal afterlife and that really, that just rubbed them wrong. That's why some of them mocked, but some were also curious and to be fair, some of them converted. It says verse 33, so Paul departed from among them. However, in verse 34, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite. So he was part of the council. He was part of the Areopagus. And a woman named Damaris and others with him. So evidently Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, as well as Damaris, some others joined him, and they came to believe. Notice it says that they joined him and believed. I believe that they joined him because they were... Very, very curious at this point. He hadn't gotten to the point of presenting the rest of the story. And I believe that they joined him and then they believed because they had opportunity to hear the rest of the gospel. They had opportunity to hear that Jesus went to the cross, that he died for their sins, that he rose from the dead, assuring eternal life to any who would come. All of that. He doesn't get a chance to go there here on Mars Hill. So as we wrap up, before we go to the Lord's table, uh, I want to talk about three things. The first is idolatry. <laughs> we don't deal with pagan altars on every street, street corner. I didn't see any on my way to church this morning. But modern day idolatry is as or more rampant now than it was in the first century. Think about it. Anything that you love, treasure, prioritize, identify with, or look to for fulfillment outside of God in Christ can be acting as an idol in your heart and in your life. I have four questions related to this. I'll move through them quickly. Things to ponder in our own hearts is what do you treasure? Do I love or treasure anything or anyone more than my love for the Lord? And that includes your spouse. The second one is, what brings you pleasure? Does anything bring more pleasure than the things of God? Third is, where do I find my identity? You hear that a lot these days, identity politics. 
Do I look for my identity in anything other than the identity I have as a child of God? Lastly, where do I find or seek fulfillment? Do I look to the world for fulfillment? Do I look to culture? Do I look to fill in the blank folks? Those things in and of themselves, there are things in my life that are very fulfilling. However, my, the ultimate fulfillment I have is only found through my relationship with Christ. So idolatry. Anything that competes for your affections above that of your affections for the Lord puts you on dangerous ground. We do well to examine our hearts. The second thing that I have here is bloom where you're planted. I think about this, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Paul's about halfway through his first missionary journey. Uh, when he gets to Corinth, he'll be as far west as he's going to go, and then he's going to turn around and head back. But in chapter 16, we saw the Holy Spirit that actually forbade Paul and Silas and Timothy from preaching the word of God in Asia. God said, no, don't. He, and Paul wanted to. So then we saw that the Spirit prevented them from going up into Bithynia. <laughs> and, and with a Macedonian call, they traveled to Philippi. They began the work of sharing the gospel there. Hadn't planned on going to Europe, but God planned on them going to Europe, and that's what he did. So after, as a, just to recap, after a lot of opposition, they left Philippi, went to Thessalonica, and they began the work of sharing the gospel there. Threatened by the unbelieving Jews, Paul traveled to Berea and began the work of sharing the gospel there. Sure enough, trouble followed. <laughs> Stuff happens. Although Paul wanted to return to Thessalonica, he couldn't. Therefore, he traveled to Athens and began the work of sharing the gospel there. Do you see a pattern in all of this? I do. Each time, it was Paul's heart to redeem the time wisely. That's what the Bible tells us to do in our own lives. Here's the point. It was never about the next stop with the Apostle Paul. It was always about where God had him in that moment. It's always about where God had him presently. Where are you? Bloom where you're planted. You might be here for a month. You might be here for the rest of your days. It's not about the next stop. It's about the here and now. It's about being present. It's about serving God with your whole heart. That's why when I look around and I see the things the Holy Spirit is doing in, in, and I keep, I have begun to get a lot more emails from other pastors saying, wow. I think what's going on at Oregon State University, wow. <laughs> There's an outpouring of God's spirit there. You're not hearing about it like you do in Asbury, uh, Kentucky, but it's happening. Other universities around the nation, the Holy Spirit is being poured out. The spirit of revival is beginning to take hold. And I told you guys a couple of weeks ago, you don't have to go and make a pilgrimage to those places because truly, if that's what the Lord is doing, it'll come to us. And I pray more and more every day that it does, that we will bloom where we're planted, that we will get, the, the Spirit of God will get a foothold in our lives that we have perhaps never experienced. And that's not to say that you lack now. Don't get me wrong on that. I don't want to have anybody walk out of here with a head trip like, well, I'm just not doing enough. I'm not this, I'm not that. That's not what Paul was doing. He was simply engaging in the work. He was simply responding to the, the moving of the Holy Spirit every stop he made. He didn't know he was going to be able to go back to Thessalonica, but I'm convinced at the end of the day, it didn't matter to him because he knew that where he was headed was keeping him in the center of God's will. And that's the point. 
I love that saying, bloom where you're planted, because, and, and folks, yeah, I, I, I'm not connected to physical work yet. Does it, do we, as a church, do we need helpers? Yeah, we do. We need people to step into different ministries. But I, I'm not going to sit up here and head trip you guys about that every Sunday. I believe that as the Spirit of God gets a hold of people's lives, they will want to serve Him. Because effective service flows from a healthy relationship, a healthy walk. It's never the other way around. You never, it's never about, I'm going to engage in service so that I can be healthier as a Christian. No, that you can cover up a weak walk with the Lord with service. But there's a place, again, uh, look at the pattern that Paul has. He just started doing the work wherever he landed. He left where he landed to the Lord. The third thing I want to talk about here as we wrap up is uh, I want to revisit the coffee, sh the coffee shop mentality. <laughs> now, there's nothing inherently wrong, as I mentioned, with it. it, it However, our world affairs, society's woes, all you're comfortable, is that all that, that you like to talk about? Is there a place that uh, perhaps you could think of ways that you could use that as a point of entry to share Jesus? I, you know, I love hanging out with the guys. I love talking about all this stuff. But I think that as, as believers especially as this age draws to a close, I want to convert that conversation about how terrible the, the culture is, how terrible things are going in politics, how terrible things are going in the community, how terrible things are with, with all of the evil that we see that's abounding everywhere. I want to use that to be able to speak real hope into people's lives because you're not going to find it in this. Like Paul, he's redirecting. He says, you know what? You need to stop thinking about it that way. You need to begin to realize there is one that holds your life in his hands. So again, I'm not picking on the coffee shop mentality. There's a place for it. But if that's all that there is, you're selling yourself short. And folks, you may discover soon how thankful someone was that you love them enough to risk turning that conversation to Jesus.